Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion from John chapter 14. We are today getting into the beginning of what I'm calling Jesus' farewell address. And he is talking about how he is the only way that we have to the Father. We'll be getting into that a little bit more and I'll explain what I mean by the farewell address. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are today in John 14, 1 through 17. And um, if you joined me last time, we were in John 13, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Now we're in uh, John 14, and Jesus began a little bit last chapter even, kind of his farewell address. And this goes all the way through, I think, John 18. Um, with, with what is often titled the High Priestly Prayer. Anyway, these events take place on the evening of Maundy Thursday, and I'm calling it Jesus' Farewell Address. I, I, I doubt that I am the first person to call it this, um, but anyway, that's what I'm calling it. Because he's about to die and rise, and after he rises, he's not consistently with the disciples. He appears to them a few times, but he's not with them in the sense that he's been with them so far. So this is kind of his last big, uh, since we're in that season of the year, graduation address, if you will. The disciples are going to graduate from seminary. Right? There's been plenty of allusions to that while I was at seminary of, of this being, anyway, I'm getting way far afield. But these are the things that Jesus wants his disciples to know and to remember and to be doing. And today, what we're going to be focusing in on I'm sure you can hear Evie crying. Um, she's fine. She's just teething, so uh, lots of tears. We are going to focus in on how Jesus is the single way to the Father, and that'll bring up with it the exclusive nature of Christianity. And, and I'll balance that with its inclusive nature. Ooh, Julia's crying too. We got two out of four crying. We're going to go for a record here. Anyway. <clears throat> John 14, 1 through 17. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Again, uh, the, the reason I'm kind of calling it the farewell address, especially down here, Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit. And as we move through this farewell address, as I call it, we're going to have a lot of Holy Spirit talk coming back again and again. Jesus is going to say a thing, a scary thing, and then he'll say, but don't worry, because the Spirit will be with you. He's saying, um, don't, don't worry, I'm about to go away. He's not saying that explicitly here. He'll say that later. I'm going away, but the Spirit is going to come and be with you forever. 
So there's a lot of Holy Spirit talk in these as we go through. <clears throat> I want to start with verses 1 through 6. And this is a very this is a very common funeral passage. My voice is a little bit hoarse <clears throat> today, so extra drinks of water. Anyway, we've got a very common funeral passage here. And one of the reasons that it is so common at funerals is because it really talks about the hope that we have as Christians. And verse 2, verse 2 is, I think, one of the most frequent images. In my Father's house are many rooms. <clears throat> if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now, especially some of you King James Christians, I, uh, anyway, um, may remember in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, whether you get a room or a mansion, I don't think is the point. Are you going to get to the new creation and see whatever there is for you and be like, uh, this is all there is? I'd rather go to hell. Like, no, <laughs> hopefully. You're not good. So I, I think it's sort of a silly thing to be worried about or, or to argue about, even worse than that, whether it's a room or a mansion. The... Does that, I don't, I don't know, maybe that does have a huge impact. Maybe that's all you were in Christianity for, was getting the mansion. And the room is just not good enough? I don't, I don't know. I, I obviously don't understand the problem. Um, anyway, enough of that. But the point is, there we go. I'm getting off on all these tangents. The point is that there is a place prepared for you. And now I can't speak to what kind of square footage we're talking or amenities or any of that sort of language, right? Jesus doesn't dwell on that either. He just says there's a place, a place. Let's focus on that. I think we can agree on that word, a place for you. You will be part of, you are, even now, you are and you will remain part of God's kingdom, part of his house in the metaphorical sense even as you will eventually be part of his house in the actual literal physical sense, be, be in his house. In my father's house are many, however you want to say that word. Okay, um, and then Jesus promised, it, you have a place, and if you have a place that's specifically for you, then obviously, Jesus says, I'm going to come back and get you and bring you to that place. This is very, and again, I want to kind of um, circle back to the funeral connection as we go through this. Because especially when the person has died, we want, we need to be reminded of that hope that we have in the resurrection. That death isn't it. That That's not the end. The casket or the urn or the whatever is not the end of that person. But instead, that person will rise and will live with God in his, in the Father's house, right? Jesus is going to come back and make sure that we are bodily, physically present with him in the Father's house. Now what I like, and, and what always makes me chuckle about the poor disciples, I'm going to put, pick on them a little bit, because they're being slightly ridiculous in this reading, uh, is the contrast between verses 4 and 5. You know the way to where I'm going. To which Thomas immediately replies, We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Because I think they're I think they expect Jesus to be like, okay, it's seven o'clock, we're having Passover. At seven thirty, we're gonna go to the Mount of Olives. And so they're like, Oh, it's seven thirty. Jesus said we're gonna go to a different place. Uh, but he's not telling us where he's going. What if we get lost on the way? See, they're, they're thinking so immediate and so literal that I, I think that's the only explanation for saying something as ridiculous as that. For, for directly confronting Jesus and being like, no, we don't know the way. Why would you say that, Jesus? We don't know the way. We don't even know where you're going. I don't know. Maybe I'm making them seem a little ridiculous than they are, or maybe this is exactly 
as ridiculous as we all are. Because I think we're a lot more like the disciples than we like to let on. I think we're a lot more like this. Jesus says a thing and we're like, why would you say that? How? We, we, that's that's not, we, we don't know how to make that so. Or we don't know that that's going to happen. Like, we, we don't tell Jesus he's a liar. And I don't think that's what they meant by this. I think they're more like, this doesn't make sense. Can you say a little bit more? That's kind of where I think they're going with this. So then we get Jesus' famous passage here. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on this one. Because as I said earlier, Christianity is both a very exclusive religion and a very inclusive religion. And I'm going to get that second one out of the way real quickly. Anybody can be saved. That's it. There's no limits. There's no criteria. There's no uh, application process. There's no payments to be made. If you're, if you're alive, you can be a Christian. That's it. That's the only, you have to be alive to be a Christian. Um, when you're dead, that's too late. It's already been decided. But if you are alive, like you are right now, you can be a Christian, and you probably are a Christian. Anybody who's alive can be a Christian. Christianity is an inclusive religion. There's absolutely nothing forbidding anyone from being a Christian. Every last single person who is alive can be a Christian. And, not but, but and, Christianity is a very exclusive religion. Because you know how all of these people can be Christians? Well, it turns out... This is the only way to know God, to be loved by God, and to spend eternity with God, to be saved using, using the language of our faith. Jesus is the only way to be saved. There's no other way. You can't do stuff. You can't, um, I was going to say no stuff, but you need to know this. You need to know Jesus. You can't earn stuff. You can't be stuff. Just Jesus. That's it. That's all we got. We just got Jesus. If you found another way to be saved, you're wrong. Absolutely wrong. Uh, Jesus is the only way that we have. No one comes to the Father except through me. Before I get there, because that's going to launch me off onto another point, um, I do want to talk about this. Pilate is going to ask, as we get, I think in John chapter 19, Jesus has... Yeah, John 19, or 18. Um, Jesus has his confrontation with Pilate, and Pilate asks, what is truth? And Jesus has already clued us in that he is truth. So he is the answer to Pilate's famous question, what is truth? It, it's that guy standing in front of Pilate, which would be Jesus. He is the way, I've already kind of talked about that, the way to, to know God, to be loved by God, to spend eternity with God, to be saved. That, that is salvation, to know and to be loved and to spend eternity with God. That, that, that's basically what we're talking about when we use the word saved or salvation. Uh, he is the truth. Everything that he says and does is showing us the Father. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in our reading, giving us um, that starting with, and I should have started with this, the supposition that God is truth. And, and so Jesus, by extension, being God, is truth. And then Jesus' words and actions showing the Father, uh, which, which he'll kind of talk about down here with our friend Philip, that Jesus shows God to us and shows us truth in his saying and doing. And then he's the life. Now, I think we talked about this way back when we were doing a study on Luke, working through Luke's gospel, that the path of Jesus is the path to life, is the path towards, again, that spending eternity with God, that, that eternal life, we use that phrase to describe it, eternal life with God. Those are all things that Jesus is. When we know Jesus, when we trust in Jesus, we have that life. We have that promise of life within us. And we have Jesus within us and, and him being life. So we have, by, by the transitive property of equality, we have life. 
if we have Jesus and Jesus is life, then we have life. That's it. That's the transitive property of equality. I think I made that up. I'm making up quite a bit of this secondary stuff today. I guess I'm in a mood. All right. <clears throat> no one comes to the Father except through me. I want to talk a little bit, and I don't think this is the primary emphasis of the text, but I will again say it's a secondary emphasis of the text. And, and that's sort of addressing who's the savior in Christianity. I know that sounds like kind of a dumb question, because it's obviously Jesus, but that also means that it's obviously not you, and it's obviously not me. If Jesus is the savior, then the position of savior is filled. And where I'm going with this is who's responsible for your salvation. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm playing this very close to the chest. Well, Jesus would be responsible for your salvation. What I want to kind of confront is um, when we make talk about, about our coming to Jesus or our deciding to kind of thing, what, what I most dislike and, and what I think, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't have anything quite charitable to say about that. What I, what I dislike about that, that's probably the most charitable I can be, is that it kind of makes me into the Savior, right? I have decided to pursue all of this stuff. Like I, was, I was presented with the choice, and I, I thought I would be a Christian. Now, I'll, I'll kind of get into this. It often appears that way. And so I think, I think people who talk that way, um, unless they're poorly intentioned, I think people who talk that way are missing a first step that, that we as Lutherans tend to talk about, which would be the work of the Spirit to kind of um, to, to kindle faith through either the Word or the sacraments. And then once that has occurred, Right, you've, you've heard the message of Jesus. Somebody's told you about Jesus, and you're like, oh yeah, Jesus, he's a great guy. I'm going to trust in him. And so it seems like you are deciding to, however you want to say that, follow Jesus. What you're really doing is not kicking the Holy Spirit out, not quashing this fire that the Holy Spirit has kindled, which... Great. I mean, I mean that is good. Like, I'm glad you're a Christian, but we we should be very hesitant to ascribe ourselves in any part of this. And the reason for that is, I screw things up, and I would be willing to bet that you screw things up repeatedly. Things that you do all the time, you screw up, and I screw up. And if we're gonna hang our eternal salvation upon ourselves. That's a terrifying prospect. Why would anyone do that? What? I don't know. I, I am in a mood, so I'm tackling all these issues. If my salvation is wholly the work of Jesus, if he's the only savior there is, he's really good at it. He's a really good savior. He's not going to screw things up. I will, and you will. But Jesus isn't going to screw things up. That's a comforting message. Jesus has this all under control. I just have to trust in him. And I get to go to the Father, into the Father's house. That's really good, especially when somebody's dead and we preach to them the message that Jesus has this under control, that the death didn't surprise Jesus or catch him off guard, but that Jesus knew the person was going to die that Jesus had been preparing a place for them and that they are with Jesus for all eternity, that is an incredibly comforting message. It doesn't make everything magically better. Nothing is going to do that. It does give you comfort knowing that this person is with their Lord. That's a good place to be. They are with Jesus. All right, let's move on. First, a drink. It's Philip's turn to say something silly. Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough. Again, <clears throat> so 
sort of in response to Jesus' words. From now on, you do know him, the Father, and have seen him. And they're like, no, we haven't. <laughs> Show us the Father. <laughs> Guys, ugh. Oh, oh when it's just, happy. it's the end of a long day, and you're you like, won't. I can't do this anymore. I oh, just can't. Yeah. I literally can't. But Jesus is so much more patient than I would be, which is really good. Because I would be like, okay, see ya, go home. We're done today. Like, we'll, tr we'll try again tomorrow. Hopefully you won't contradict me twice Bye. in a row. Oh, yeah, see, Paul thinks it's the end. Um, we'll, we'll try next time. Like, Hopefully you won't con contradict God twice in a row. I don't know. May maybe that's the best we can hope. Anyway, I'm being very, very facetious. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say you show us the Father? Don't you know? And Jesus is going to um, explain in a little bit. We'll get to these words I just highlighted. That everything he's said and done is from the Father and is meant for the purpose of revealing the Father, and revealing the Father's attitude and disposition towards us, revealing, revealing the Father's intention for us, which is to bring us to his house. So how can they say they don't know anything about the Father? Here's, here's what I just said Jesus said. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. These works that, Je that Jesus does, not that I do. These works that Jesus does are from the Father and are revealing the Father. And by the way, since um, Trinity Sunday was uh, almost two weeks ago, right, we've got a little bit of, a little bit of Trinity language here. Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus. Now it doesn't say that Jesus is the Father and the Father is Jesus. It doesn't say that, because that would be wrong. That would make you a heretic. But it does say that Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in him. Now, I don't know why that's different, but it is different, and that's not heretical, because Jesus doesn't say heretical things. We have to start with that position. Anyway, we'll never really understand the Trinity, right? I said that um, in, this, in the sermon I gave about two weeks ago. We won't understand the Trinity, but we can kind of say some things about it. So here Jesus is saying a thing about it. <clears throat> okay. Now, re really in these last passages, hold on, Polly, let me finish this. Really in these last passages, Jesus is turning towards his disciples. Now, don't don't take that as too much contrast, because in this first section, he's still he's saying all of this for the benefit of his disciples. But now it's really, okay, like, here's what you guys need to know. Here's what Jesus is saying to his followers. Verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. When we pray, and again, this isn't a 100% rule. This is a typically you should kind of thing. Uh, in, in, the, in kind of the strictest sense, we pray to the Father in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're all involved in it. But we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. And the reason we do that <clears throat> is from passages like this. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Right? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, it is still proper to pray to Jesus. That's okay. That does not make you a heretic, praying to Jesus. That's okay. And for what it's worth, praying to the Holy Spirit is okay too. Right? They're all God. Praying to God is the important thing. We pray to the Father because he's... <clears throat> uh, we sort of attribute to him the, the upholding of creation and the sustaining of all things and kind of the... This is going to sound a little heretic. The, the one who does stuff. That's not to say Jesus doesn't do anything or the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything. But the Father is the one kind of doling stuff out um, through different things. Like doling out salvation to us through Jesus. Doling out his word to us through the Holy Spirit. Doling out blessings to us through, my window's over there, through this creation that he has made. 
That's not to say Jesus can't or won't or doesn't, or the Holy Spirit can't or won't or doesn't do things or do things for us. It's that this is this is kind of the majority rule. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. And this is going to be even more explicit later on. Jesus will say something like, um, up until now you have not asked anything, but whatever you ask the Father in my name, this he will do. Right? Jesus is going to make it even more explicit. You ask the Father in Jesus' name. So that's kind of the, the pattern that we have for prayer is from Jesus' words here and then that later passage too. Verse 15 sounds, especially since we've dropped in here and we've kind of skipped the second half of 13, sounds, boy, that highlighting is just horrible. There we go. Sounds like it comes from nowhere. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But Jesus has just been talking about that in John 13. And here's where reading through the whole thing offers benefits. Even over us kind of skipping about every other day is kind of what we do. That Jesus has been saying this in the second half of chapter 13. So this is not a new or different or surprising thing. This is a repetition. And a lot of what Jesus says, quite honestly, in verse or uh, chapters 13 through 18, there, there is quite a bit of repetition to it, using different images, putting it different ways, just straight up repeating things. Because sometimes you need to repeat things. Sometimes you need to repeat things. Sometimes you need to repeat things. Before people understand and remember <laughs> what's going on. So Jesus is repeating things to help us understand. Now, like I said at the beginning, we've got some Holy Spirit language coming through here, and this is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. I'm almost out of water, so I better be almost out of devotion. Fulfilled on the day of Pentecost for the disciples, and for us, fulfilled on whenever we first heard God's word or were baptized. That's, that's basically it. It's kind of unexciting. Well, it's very exciting. Um, it's very, also very easy to describe. I don't know. Whenever you first heard God's word or were baptized, you got the Holy Spirit. Boom. There it is. For some of you, that may have been before you were born. There's, I'll let, I'll let. When, if your mother took you to the services of God's house before you were born, you heard the word. And you probably, I would, I would say that you had faith even before you were born. And yes, before you were baptized too. There we go. Somebody's going to get me in trouble, but I think that's true. I think that's pretty true. Because the word of God can grant faith. It is not only baptism. Baptism is not the only thing which can grant faith. As if the word of God were powerless to bestow the gift of faith. Right? That's, that's kind of the point that I'm making. The word of God can bestow faith upon us. Uh, baptism can also bestow faith upon us. So when either of those things happen, you received the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm trying to say. I do have a special guest here. Can you lean over, honey, so people can see you? Oh, she's just, she's barely off camera. I moved the stool because I, um, I'll, I'll, another aside since I've made so many, I'll play games with my kids on the computer and I usually sit on the stool, so I moved it back um, and I just didn't move it back. So, special guest, There we go. There's my special guest. Okay. I think that's pretty much it. He dwells with you and will be in you. Happens on Pentecost. There we go. That's it. Good good timing, Julia. I was just finishing up. We've got the start, or not quite the start, but, but a continuation of Jesus' farewell address. And he is giving us the comforting message that we will spend eternity with God in his house, in the Father's house. And reinforcing that exclusive nature of Christianity that only Christians will be saved. That's it. Not, not any other people. If you're not a Christian, you're not saved. That's it. If you are, then you are saved. That's how easy it is. It's a very, very easy thing to say. <clears throat> people don't like to hear exclusive things today. So Christianity is kind of offensive 
I don't especially want to get into that on the outro. But it is also an inclusive thing because all of the alive people can be Christians. They all can. There's nothing stopping them except themselves, which is ultimately unfortunate. Anyway, oh, we need to pray. We need to pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. And we ask that you would continue to keep us in faith until we are with you in the Father's house. We pray this in your name. Amen. And see, there we go. I prayed to Jesus in his own name. That was not a wrong prayer or anything. I usually end up doing that. So just just pray. Right? That's the important thing. Anyway, Juliet, you want to say bye-bye? Here, point your face up. Point your face up there.